to the Precision Medicine virtual event. Uh, my name is Dwayne Hassani. I'm an assistant professor of computational biomedicine and medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine and uh, director of leukemia genomics for the uh, Englander Institute for Precision Medicine. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, clonal hematopoiesis and pre-leukemia. Please feel free to submit questions during my presentation and I'll follow up with you by email. So a little bit of quick background. Uh, my lab works in the area of acute myeloid leukemia. It's a fatal disease with dismal outcomes. The uh, most pertinent fact for this presentation is the fact that it's a sudden onset disease. So people typically uh, present suddenly. Um, there's sometimes individuals who progress from MDS to AML. Uh, but many people, it's a very devastating and sudden diagnosis. So they come in typically, uh, the physicians will refer to something as a Friday night leukemia. Uh, typically, it happens before weekends, so we get our samples on a weekend. And it's because, you know, people feel that they are uh, under the weather uh, and uh, are seeking medical attention at the ER, uh, you know, to solidify their weekend plans. But what happens is, is what they thought may have been a cold or a flu uh, in time turns into a, a, a leukemia diagnosis. And unlike many cancers, it has to be addressed immediately. So there's really an unmet need for uh, identification of high-risk individuals who need to be monitored for uh, risk of AML. So can we identify in the population of healthy individuals, those who are more likely to progress to AML? It's a disease that's actually relatively rare occurring, you know, in a handful per 100,000 people. So depending on the age category, but we can consider it to occur in five to 100,000 people. AML, like uh, many cancers, uh, arises via the stepwise acquisition of mutations. So it is a disease of the hematopoietic system. And it begins, you know, with this pristine hematopoietic system that we're essentially uh, born with that acquires somatic mutations over time. Somatic mutations are generally not selected for, so most somatic mutations are neutral. Uh, so we're uh, pretty much uh, developing these mutations uh, even before birth. So they're there accumulating. Uh, but really with no selection pressure. But over time, there's this, um, this, this process of expansion that occurs via selective pressures or just random mutations that gain a clonal advantage. Uh, so this clonal expansion is termed clonal hematopoiesis. It's actually quite common in the general population. So if you look at, an, at a population of individuals that are about 50 years of age or older, we find, and other studies find, that um, more recent studies find that 25% of individuals over 50 years of age exhibit some form of mutation in their blood. Typically, these mutations occur in very specific genes, which I'll get to, uh, but these genes also happen to be the genes that, are, uh, that pose risk for acute myeloid leukemia. So they're the early driver events of acute myeloid leukemia, but most people, the vast majority of people are fine and don't get leukemia. So we're interested in actually understanding, you know, what it is that discerns a, a, a leukemia, uh, a gene that's likely, a mutation that's likely to progress to leukemia versus a uh, mutation that's not likely to progress to leukemia. These mutations accumulate. You develop leukemia stem cells, and then for further mutational complexity, uh, we develop a full-blown leukemia. Clonal hematopoiesis, um, occurs in genes that are associated with AML. So we can see here, and this is, uh, there's several reports. This is a more recent report from Nature Communications, um, looking at uh, the mutation spectrum uh, of people's healthy blood. So we can see most mutations occur in DNMP3A, TET2, B-Core, STAG2, ASXL1, KRAS is seen in some cases. These are the mutations that are important for uh, the early events in uh, AML, and they're just found in, in, in a very significant number of people. Uh, so they're, they're in healthy persons. Uh, what we need to do is discern what it is that differentiates, differentiates these mutations from uh, mutations that progress to leukemia. So the, uh, there were studies going back to 2014 and a little bit before that as well, but there were two major papers that came out in 2014 in the New England Journal of Medicine. One was by Joss Wall and colleagues. The other one was by Genovese and colleagues. And what they did was they looked at large uh, population uh, cohorts and looked at the risk of progression to any hematologic malignancy, not just AML, uh, and found essentially that um, even though the risk is obviously not absolute, 
uh, for progression to any hematologic malignancy. Uh, this posed an 11 to 13 fold risk of eventual hematologic malignancy. So this is not just AML, it's AML, it's other myeloid neoplasms, uh, certain lymphomas and CLL, all of that included. Certain high risk presentations of clonal hematopoiesis confer a 1% rate of progression to a hematologic malignancy per year. So this is a risk that accumulates over time. And in that high risk presentation, it, um, it actually roughly approximates the progression from MGUS to myeloma, uh, which is another precursor condition. So clonal hematopoiesis is a uh, condition that could be thought of as a precursor condition in very particular contexts. In addition, uh, clonal hematopoiesis confers an elevated risk of cardiovascular disease. So for those individuals who are not progressing to cancer, depending on the specific mutation pattern and, specific, uh, and the specific cardiovascular event, you're looking at a two-fold risk, but uh, some, some risks um, are tenfold or more uh, in terms of cardiovascular disease. So these clones are not inert even in the people who are not progressing to hematologic cancers. It uh, turns out, and there's a body of literature demonstrating a wide variety of pro-inflammatory and prolonged inflammatory responses in these individuals, favoring things like uh, the accumulation of macrophages and arterial wall. So this is a general and huge health concern um, that needs to be studied more carefully uh, to determine what the risk factors are for particular individuals. We've seen that clonal hematopoiesis is seen uh, concurrent with AML, and this is intuitively obvious. So if you look at the uh, slide I showed previously regarding the uh, progression from uh, normalcy to acute myeloid leukemia, there's a stepwise acquisition of mutations, and sometimes the precursors are still uh, dominant clones. So early in, this is uh, actually a film of poster we presented back in 2012, what we did was we were looking to see what the mutation patterns uh, were in acute myeloid leukemia patients to identify, uh, you know, whether there were differences in the uh, compartments of an individual's disease. So what we could see is if you look at DNMT3A, which is one of the canonical um, clonal hematopoiesis mutations, the most common one, DNMT3A mutations were present in the bulk stem and lymphocyte compartments, so indicating that these were early events occurring in a stem cell they were, and the mutations were propagated into the lymphoid and into the myeloid compartment. If we look at uh, NRAS uh, here, uh, NRAS was another mutation present in that individual's AML. Unlike uh, DNMT3A, uh, it was not present in the lymphocytes, looking at the panel on the right. So we can see that in the bulk AML and the AML stem cell fraction, which is phenotypically defined and sorted, um, we can see that the mutation uh, is occurring in the uh, myeloid malignancy, but the lymphoid compartment is completely pristine in this regard. So what we think is happening uh, in this model, which is consistent with what I showed previously, is that DNMT3A mutation acquisition is an early event. It is propagated into the lymphoid compartment, and then some fraction of lymphocytes will uh, demonstrate DNMT3A mutations. But once there's myeloid commitment, uh, NRAS mutations are acquired, and this leads to overt disease. So suggesting the utility of an early detection strategy, if we could actually determine what individuals with what particular mutations will progress to AML. So our lab became very interested in predicting um, AML. As I said before, it is an emergency condition, and, and more than half of presentations of AML are sudden with no prior warning. So no precursor condition, no MDS, no other hematologic abnormality. So we sought to determine if we could define a pre-leukemic state that is different from clonal hematopoiesis or identify at least what the various risks are with particular mutation patterns uh, in individuals with regard to that risk. So we looked at the impact of specific clonal mutations that were um, present in any heme malignancy. Uh, no study to date has evaluated serial samples at the point uh, that we initiated the study to look at the uh, clonokinetics. So the, um, the how these mutations uh, inform the timing from detection to present, excuse me, the presentation of disease. And our goal really was to, to there's, there's an acronym used in the field, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, which is meant to underscore the uncertain nature of what will happen with individuals with clonal hematopoiesis. And so we wanted to move more and more away from indeterminate. 
So to do this, uh, we could have done it prospectively and it would have taken many, many years. Uh, but what we had access to was the Women's Health Initiative study. So we turned to blood samples that were banked going back to the early 90s, 1991, and were followed for uh, up to 20 years. So all of what I'm showing you is actually published in our Nature Medicine study, uh, which is shown here. It's the published main article. And there are various interesting perspectives articles that are accompanying news and views from um, Bob Sellers, Sid Joswell, and Ben Ebert. Uh, in the same edition, in the same issue, and various highlights articles that uh, give various different perspectives on, 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 on what our data actually mean. So I actually encourage anyone to read those. Our study design drew from the Women's Health Initiative cohort, which uh, comprised 161,808 women who were 50 to 79 years of age at baseline evaluation. And these women are uh, 50 years older and all postmenopausal. So that's one uh, aspect of one manner in which our, our, our population differs somewhat from a general population in the 50 to 79 year old group. It's all women, all postmenopausal. Uh, from this, we're able to identify 212 centrally adjudicated cases of AML. These are individuals with a confirmed AML diagnosis during WHI follow up. And uh, 9.6 years was the medium time to diagnosis in the 188 cases that we could evaluate by next generation sequencing. Alongside that, we have age matched, obviously gender matched uh, controls uh, that were mat matched by age, uh, non AML cancer history, and 181 of those were valuable by NGS. From those, we actually have the largest serial sequencing study of clonal hematopoiesis with 132 individuals with follow up at one year or three years and 128 with serial samples um, at one year or three years. And to do this, we performed deep targeted sequencing using a targeted panel at a 2000X median depth of coverage, which we were calling events down to 1% variant allele fraction. There's uh, some controversy in the literature as to what comprises a right clone size. And I think what the field is looking for are more data-driven, more clinically driven uh, approaches to defining what those cutoffs should be. In addition to that, because we used a large uh, in-solution capture panel, we were able to identify translocations, so we'd actually uh, included intronic dates as well, as well as copy number events. So we, we got this very broad molecular portrait of uh, genes that are involved in both lymphoid and myeloid malignancies to look at what the uh, mutation state is like in healthy individuals at an average of 9.6 years at a median of 9.6 years prior to their diagnosis. So what's very important to remember is that these are healthy women at baseline. So if you look at um, the AML cases, so the AML cases are individuals who have developed AML. And you look at any, any particular parameter, you look at hematocrit, white blood count, hemoglobin, and platelets, there's really no difference between the control and the case group. So this is a case control design, and uh, these parameters are largely similar uh, between the two groups. So no, no real differences here. So these are people who are generally hematologically normal, uh, who wouldn't really trigger any red flags in terms of any hematologic parameter, yet they're harboring, in some cases, mutations. So what we did is we took this cohort and we deeply sequenced it using our uh, first panel. And uh, this is essentially what the mutation spectrum looks like. So um, on the left side, you can see the AML cases um, with the uh, red uh, title. That's 188 individuals and 181 matched controls. So you can see right away that the AML, the people who developed AML, so these are pre-AML cases, have more mutations in a more complex mutation spectrum. So not only do you see singleton mutations, but you see more co-mutations um, and just generally a, a higher proportion of individuals who are mutated. Um, notably absent, though, are FLT3, ITD, and MPM1. So to an individual who's a trained, um, a trained leukemia expert. Looking at this, it looks very much very similar to the um, mutation spectrum you would see if you looked at one of the classical AML papers, um, looking early on some work by uh, Tim Lay, um, going back several years now. Uh, if you look at the controls, you see the controls are mostly uh, pristine. So we have DNMT3A mutations in a significant number of the cohort some TEP2 mutations, but really hardly anything else. 
much much simpler mutation pattern, um, many fewer individuals mutated. Uh, we also were able to detect um, some copy number uh, changes. So we saw, you know, deletion 13, deletion 7Q, and some trisomies in a few individuals. So the pre-AML, to reiterate, was more complex. So if you actually looked at the same individuals, not were only were they mutated, but some of them had multiple mutations per gene. This was a feature that was not uh, as common in the, in the uh, benign clonal hematopoiesis group who did not develop AML. So if you look here, uh, for example, at uh, TET2, which is a nice and interesting example, uh, TET2 cases um, present in, in, in most cases, in many cases, and more in probably half of cases here, uh, are showing more than one mutation. Uh, so individuals who have more than one TET2 mutation are, are indicated by the non uh, red color uh, shown there. So some have two mutations, some have three mutations, and that's indicated in the number of variants key uh, down below. So there are definitely uh, people who have more t uh, t two mutations per individual, and this is a finding that was not seen in any individual in the pre-AML in the uh, in the control cohort. Um, which is actually an interesting finding because in in AML when it's diagnosed de novo. Uh, individuals present typically with a single TET2 mutation. So, you know, theoretically, what this, what this poses the possibility for is a uh, some driver process that's favoring multiple TET2 mutations, and one of those TET2 mutations goes on to progress to uh, AML, and the other TET2 mutation doesn't progress. So, I think if you were to actually deeply sequence um, AML individuals with TET2 mutations, you might find a, a non-dominant subclone that is only TET2 mutated. This is something that needs to be uh, tested. But we, we thought that that was an interesting uh, way of discerning uh, the cases from the controls. Um, more importantly, we had a 30% rate of clonal hematopoiesis. Previous studies were talking about rates in the 5 to 10% range. So we did a lot of things differently uh, than, than were done previously, and this is uh, basically due to uh, technical limitations of the previous studies. They had exome sequencing data. They used the exome sequencing data they had to do a great study. Uh, but these were done on uh, Agilent, and uh, there were some uh, issues with Agilent whole exome sequencing, especially around TET2. So what I'm doing is uh, showing you an IgG uh, image. Uh, the top track is showing uh, an, a representative example of a uh, Agilent sure select all exome 2. And what we're showing here is the relatively poor coverage uh, that was, and this is actually acknowledged in the paper, so if you actually read the supplemental data in the uh, Joswell Genovese study, uh, this, this fact is alluded to uh, in, in, in each of the studies. Um, but if you look at the panel we developed, we're sequencing much, much deeper, and we're actually covering all the exons. So about um, half of the exons are actually being missed in TET2, and that's actually quite a substantial amount of exon space. So just from, you know, from exon coverage alone, we expected our TET2 mutation rate to be double, and then from depth of coverage, we expect it to be higher than that. Uh, so we think that our uh, rate of TET2 mutations is accurate, and that most studies previously, through no fault of their own, were just underpowered uh, just due to the available data that they had. So going back again, uh, the Joswell Genovese studies in 2014 sequenced at 70 to 80x, there's a more recent paper that sequenced at about 500x. Uh, it was a Coombs et al. cell stem cell paper looking at clonal hematopoiesis in solid tumors um, using the MSK impact panel. Um, but what we can see um, from a study in Nature Communications by Shin and colleagues where they were looking at um, how powered you need to be to detect mutations at certain variant allele fraction cutoffs. Um, to, to detect a, a 2% variant allele fraction cutoff, which is a working definition uh, for clonal hematopoiesis, you need at least 1,000x coverage. So you can see here at below 100x, you're really poorly, poorly powered to detect anything, you know, below, uh, you know, 10% 10, 10%, uh, in this case. So you're hugely underpowered. You're missing, um, missing four out of five events occurring in the low VAF range. So it's a, it's a huge underestimation. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the conclusions of the, of the old studies are accurate, and our conclusions uh, seem to be uh, accurate and consistent. So 
So this is just showing the various technical definitions uh, of clonal hematopoiesis, and depending on the allylic fraction cutoffs that are used and uh, the standardization approach and what is called pathogenic, you can see it can vary. So we can actually make it in line with previous studies if we use parameters that were used by previous studies, showing our studies actually relatively consistent with, um, with, with previous work. Overall, we had generally great coverage across the board, so we're showing on um, the major mutations associated with clonal hematopoiesis and leukemia, DNMT3A, TET2, P53, ASXL1, SRSF2, SF3D1, IDH2, JAK2, uh, great coverage in all the genes, very few low spots. Of the interesting mutation patterns we noticed was that uh, younger patients um, had a young, there, were, there was a younger age of onset for uh, mutations in DNMT3 and TET2 for the pre-ML cases versus controls. So if you look at TET2, for example, if you look in the under 65 group, 10% uh, were uh, mutated in TET2 at, under the age of 65 in individuals who got AML, but barely anyone, 2.6%, so essentially a five-fold increase uh, in the mutation rate uh, of uh, individuals who got uh, AML uh, when these mutations were detected in the under 65 group. So individuals progressing to AML uh, demonstrated mutations uh, at an earlier age than individuals who did not progress to AML. The risk is actually elevated by the particular mutation and the number of mutations. So the most risky mutation we found was P53, uh, followed by uh, double positive TET2. So actually, the double positive TET2 uh, mutations rivaled the risk that was present with P53, so both demonstrating more than 50-fold odds ratio. Single TET2 mutations were risky. Same pattern with DNMT3A and double DNMT3A. Uh, we could see the risk goes from 2 to 12.6 with two or more uh, DNMT3A mutations. Uh, mutations in one, uh, it's a crucial AML driver gene, IDH1 or IDH2, demonstrated a 30-fold risk. Uh, we saw some, um, some increase with JAK2 and, and increase with spliceosome, so spliceosome being SF3D1 mutations, SRSF2, and um, ZRSR2. We didn't see a pattern with ASXL1. So it's important when you come away from this slide to not think that if you detect P53 in an individual in a healthy population, that that means that they're going to get AML. So in our study, no individuals who uh, in, the, in the healthy group had a P53 or an IDH mutation. Uh, but there's really two important caveats to note there when you walk away from this. One is that P53 is a precursor to other conditions, CLL, for example. Um, and our study was a case control design. So what we did was we had this ascertainment bias in which we selected individuals who developed AML. Thus, if we were to proceed into a CLL study, we would also expect the P53 being a CLL driver mutation would also um, demonstrate uh, a risk. Not sure what the magnitude would be, but um, the general principle would be the same and that P53 would pose a higher risk. Theoretically, we haven't done the experiment yet. Um, and our sample size. So we're looking at 181 cases. It's possible that if we sequence thousands of cases, we might find P53 and IDH mutations that did not progress to AML. But nonetheless, the odds are significantly increased. So high-risk mutation patterns here seem to be P53 mutations, IDH mutations, and double TET2 mutations. So People with mutations, so if you imagine AML progressing from a stepwise acquisition of mutations, the more steps you've taken, the closer you are to getting AML, and that's exactly what we see with the data. So here we're looking at cumulative event analyses, uh, looking um, at individuals who have no mutation versus individuals who have a mutation. If you look at the panel on the left, you can see uh, these two curves, and uh, anybody with any mutation uh, developed AML at a sooner time than individuals who had no mutations and who developed AML. So looking at uh, 12 years in, uh, median time to diagnosis in individuals who presented with no mutation, that's accelerated to a number closer to seven in individuals who had any mutation whatsoever in their blood. If you look at the stepwise acquisition of mutations, the expectation is, is the more mutations you have, the faster you progress to AML, and that's exactly what you see. The individuals with no mutation uh, are still taking about 12 years to develop. One mutation uh, takes just a little bit under 10 years, 
uh, but we're moving closer now to six years uh, with individuals who have two or more mutations. So you can see that progressive shift downward uh, as individuals acquire more mutations. We also find that uh, greater clonal complexity and uh, clone size are related and consistent again with the intuition I was just presenting about oncogenesis. So individuals who have large clones that have become dominant with allelic fractions of over 10% demonstrate an increased risk relative to individuals who have uh, lower than 10% allelic fractions. The same holds true and even more true for uh, TET2. So uh, high risk TET2 over 10%, lower risk below 10%. Splicey zone uh, showed a trend toward this, but the trend that was not uh, wildly significant. But you can still see that there's a difference. If you also look at the maximum clone size, so that would be the largest clone. So if you had a clone with 25% allelic fraction, just hypothetically, um, what we found was that the larger the clone size, the more co-mutations it has. So if you look at the ANL cases, you can see as the clone size increases on the y-axis, the number of co-mutations increases. In controls, this held true as well, uh, but not to the same extent, and nobody had five mutations uh, in the controls. So you can see again the, uh, the, the march toward AML is very evident, um, more so even if you look at the right panel. So we also, uh, as I said before, did probably the largest uh, serial sequencing study of uh, clonal hematopoiesis. So we're able to look at individuals at one year or three year. Here I'm showing you three year. And the plot's showing allelic fraction at baseline on the x-axis and allelic fraction at uh, year three, I picked, um, on the y-axis. As you can see, uh, DNMT3A mutations largely to sit on the diagonal, meaning no change. TET2 mutations, um, not very many are changed. Most are still sitting on the diagonal. P53 mutations, there's a bit of an increase. There's much more of an increase of SRSF2 and IDH2. If you look at the mutation-specific risk using a statistical model, uh, accounting for co-mutations and looking at the independent risk of these posts, um, what we can see is that IDH mutations generally show uh, the, uh, a greater uh, clonal growth uh, per, per unit time, independently of SRSF2, U2AF1. Uh, so these are all individual risks for these mutations, which is consistent with the plot shown on the left. We also saw different patterns of clonal evolution between baseline and diagnosis. So as individuals progressed to AML, the uh, subsequent clones got bigger um, and, and acquired more mutations. I'm showing you four cases here. Uh, these are explained in the manuscript in more detail if you look at them, but I think for the purposes of this discussion, we can look at case A. So case A uh, is, a, is a woman who presented a baseline with only an IDH uh, canonical mutation in the R140. I think it was an R140Q. And uh, this mutation was present at uh, just over 5% uh, allelic fraction at, at baseline. Um, as I said before, uh, driver events uh, for um, the, the, that promote the progression to leukemia, so, uh, FLIT3, ITD, and MPM1 are, are hugely common events in, in AML. Those weren't present in the healthy group. But what we can see here is that she went in for her baseline evaluation, for, uh, for follow-up to her baseline evaluation at one year. When we look at that at one year, we can see that an MPM1 mutation popped up. Uh, but this person was actually still considered healthy uh, for whatever reason. Uh, but it turned out 27 days later after that year one time point, the person developed an AML diagnosis. So this shows you that the early events leading to AML, such as in this case the IDH2 mutation, um, are present, but the progression to AML required the introduction of a cooperating mutation in MPM1. And once that mutation appeared, at some point between zero and one year, the progression to AML was very quick. Uh, so again, in under a month after this diagnosis. So all in all, I think our study uh, defined a number of high risk factors for AML, but we're still not at a position where we can look at an individual in the population and say, um, you are at an absolute risk or even have a 95% probability of AML. We're really far from that. But what we can do is uh, identify mutations that are uh, mutations that are higher risk. And what to do about those mutations is an open question. 
Uh, but what we do know is that the highest risk uh, is mutations in P53, IDH1 and IDH2. In our cohort, anybody who had those mutations uh, developed AML. It doesn't mean that in a larger population, so if we sample 10,000 people as opposed to 181, we might find uh, a, a false positive rate. Large clones, um, greater than 10% allelic fraction demonstrated a significantly uh, increased risk. We found that multiple TEP2 mutations posed a risk that was very comparable to a P53 mutation, and we think that's interesting, something to pay more attention to. Spliceosome mutations co-occurring, especially with DNMP3, were risky. Anybody with uh, one or more mutation had uh, risk. And anybody with a fast-growing uh, clone for P53 or IDH2. So if the uh, P53 or IDH mutation were static over a period of three years, not changed, uh, those individuals were at much lower risk than individuals who um, showed an increase in, in clone size. Uh, this, is, this is outlined uh, well in the, in the actual paper. So we need to do better, obviously, because like I said before, we don't have the ability to, um, to, to look at these, to, to look at just mutations and say, uh, you're uh, an individual that's going to proceed to AML. I think it's probably worth watching IDH1 and IDH2 individuals, um, but in, in, in other cases, it's, it's not entirely clear. So we're working at our center to really include many more parameters. So we want uh, medical data, so identifying uh, at-risk persons based on health abnormalities, uh, so we're employing machine learning uh, approaches to see, you know, if you're a high normal white blood count versus a low normal white blood count plus a mutation, uh, how does that actually modify your risk? So incorporating uh, data outside of the mutation spectrum. Uh, looking at epigenetic, uh, epigenetic marks, so do epigenetic marks uh, provide added information on who progresses to AML or not? There's an interesting study uh, showing a higher rate of clonal hematopoiesis mutations, not peer-reviewed, it's in bioarchive. Uh, demonstrating that epigenetic age is associated with uh, the presence of clonal hematopoiesis. These mutations are, are in epigenetic modifier genes, so it's an actual, it's an interesting entanglement between the two processes. And then serum factors. So uh, clonal hematopoiesis uh, has been associated with an increase in uh, inflammatory factors. Uh, so there's population um, data actually showing this. So, you know, do immunological and metabolic parameters uh, even help distinguish pre-AML from AML? So, um, it's definitely important to get other parameters into this equation, medical history, epigenetic data, and, and further uh, in improving the risk stratification. Uh, because, again, this is a very rare disease. So, it's a disease occurring in, um, you know, a few in 100,000 people. So, a false positive rate of 1% is actually very high in a rare disease that's occurring in you know, uh, like I said, five in 100,000 people. We have a huge false positive rate. So this is something that needs to be refined. Um, in terms of why we would do it at population level, we think as the risk of um, the clonal hematopoiesis poses in cardiovascular disease becomes more and more established, the probability of it uh, becoming incorporated in a standard of care workup for at least a subset of individuals might enable more uh, population level sequencing. So in summary, we should be thinking about the exposome. So we shouldn't be incorporating uh, baseline genetics, uh, childhood illnesses, um, history of pathogen exposure, which has been shown to influence the growth of um, blood cells harboring clonal hematopoiesis mutations and other such factors, uh, given that uh, clonal hematopoiesis uh, is a measure of, of molecular aging, which brings us to our molecular aging initiative uh, that we're conducting and initiating at the Englander Institute. So after all of this, what we decided was that what we needed was a cheaper test um, that we've actually termed precise one. We're looking at uh, genes that are associated with clonal hematopoiesis, genes associated with leukemia, and hereditary risk determinants, so things that are known to influence clonal hematopoiesis, DNA damage, et cetera, and sequence at high depth over a 500 KB capture space that was enabled by TWIST. Um, technology. So we're looking at a sensitivity target of 1 to 2% variant allele fraction. Uh, and in doing that, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, make sure that we are powered, um, you know, at, at about 95% for uh, mutations occurring at 2% or greater, 
which seem to be uh, clinically significant. And this is a, a moving target again. So as there are more data in the field establishing what parameters are important for uh, what cutoffs are clinically significant, uh, we expect this to be a moving target. Our data and data from a few other groups uh, show that allylic fractions of 1%, uh, as shown in our IDH2 mutations, for example, uh, in our study could be clinically significant as well. So, um, but as our, as, our, as our baseline, we're trying to get at least 2%, and uh, we've been sequencing in many cases to 2,000x to get that 1% number. So off the bat, you know, twi uh, we developed um, the, the platform with TWIST and got excellent coverage over the, the uh, exons that are coding for DNMT3A. So this is, again, showing the IGV view. And we can see here that there's uh, excellent uh, depth of coverage, and most exons are covered relatively uniformly. We look at TET2, and we can compare this uh, going back to the previous slide I showed you on TET2. Um, most coding exons are well covered uh, for TET2. There's uh, some variation between exons, but um, the high point of this is, uh, I think, a few thousand X, and the low point of this is 500 X in terms of what exons are covered. So we have very good coverage for, for TET2 uh, on this particular uh, panel and precise one. And uh, ASXL1 did a great job as well. So the last two, we actually went with an approach as there are new resistance determinants and interesting uh, variants being identified all the time. We actually just did all the coding exons in our uh, precise one panel with twist, but the um, but the uh, last two exons, of, uh, especially the last exon of ASX, the one of those that are most important, and you can see uh, great coverage across the uh, coding region. So one thing we were particularly happy with was uh, coverage in GC-rich regions. So a particularly challenging gene, in, uh, an important gene in uh, AML diagnosis is um, CDP-alpha. So it's actually important for risk stratification of AML and has some applications in minimal residual disease. We're able to get nice uniform coverage, relatively speaking, um, across the entirety of the gene body. So it's in the middle of CDP alpha, there's a very GC rich tract that you, can see, uh, you can't see in this particular plot, but the very middle tends to be very poorly covered um, in, in many first runs. Um, so we, we actually had a, a relatively decent uh, outcome uh, in, 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 in our first uh, interaction with uh, TWIST on this. Results will vary though. We find that uh, the GC rich region um, is a little bit sensitive to lab techniques. So we will see a little bit uh, sometimes better than this, sometimes worse than this, but uh, never a complete bald spot in, in the middle of CDP alpha. So this is actually a great result. It's also very clean. So you can see here at 1,180 X coverage, we have no mutations down to 2% of the fraction. So we're essentially able to take the library prep protocols and um, that we're able to use in the nature medicine study make a few minor adaptations to um, facilitate the twist protocol uh, to do this. And uh, essentially, we're able to um, use the, the previous library capture uh, library prep protocol with the twist capture protocol and uh, get a, a good panel working off the bat. Another area where we were pleased was the excellent uniformity uh, we got with our precise one panel. So here's a random selection of 10 samples on the y-axis I'm showing you. Uh, millions of past filter reads, and the fold 80 base penalty is shown on the x-axis. And you can see here for the 10 samples, uh, all of them had a, a 1.3 uh, fold 80 base penalty, which is, uh, I think, really great. And this was um, fold 80 base penalty is uh, the sequencing required for 80% of bases to achieve the coverage uh, median. So that was great. Going forward, uh, we're planning to deploy uh, the Precise One platform at our center to look at larger cohorts assessing clinical hematopoiesis. We need to perform more detailed QC analyses of our current platform, um, applying additional boosting of baits if needed. And we are also able to adapt and extend the panel to disease-specific applications. So if we want it to be a lymphoma panel a little bit better than it is a leukemia panel, we can easily make those adaptations. And importantly, uh, even we use some of the libraries that we've already generated. So this is a huge study, uh, actually, and it was uh, made possible really by, by a large team. 
I need to acknowledge the uh, first authors and lead authors, um, Pinkle Desai and Miriam and Sia Trincha. Pinkle, uh, uh, Dr. Desai interacted with the uh, Women's Health Initiative cohort, and Nuria uh, did much of the analysis and sequencing, um, and with support from a, a huge, huge team. Um, we have uh, funding was provided actually by Leukemia Fighters, for which we're thankful. Uh, some slides here were funded by Leukemia Lymphoma Society, uh, including uh, funding we got from our, from our own cancer center. And of course, we're eternally grateful to the Women's Health Initiative for uh, actually making this study possible. It would have taken many, many years to get to the point uh, that we did. So I'm going to uh, close with uh, my contact information and uh, the disclosure that uh, this, this uh, talk was uh, sponsored by uh, TWIST. Uh, if anybody has any questions, obviously you're free to contact me using the, um, the, the, uh, the interface, uh, or you can email me directly, and I'm also on Twitter. Uh, I'm happy to discuss any of the details. Uh, of the study or any technical parameters of our precise one test or any other question you may have. Thank you for listening.